I'd like to ask a question. How can we leverage ourselves to help other people? And this is something that I think it applies to anybody, no matter what your age is. If, well, let's just say age 12 or, or greater. And leverage means, in case you're not quite sure, you do something, uh, you apply yourself in some way that other people benefit from what it is that you do. And e even better said, if they benefit spiritually. And I would like to look at three individuals this evening. Uh, Nehemiah, a uh, Gentile woman, sometimes referred to her as a Syro-Phoenician Syro woman in uh, the book of Mark, although we will be reading out of Matthew about her. And finally, uh, look at Elisha. And then I had something happen after church this morning, and I'm also going to mention that. I hadn't counted on this, but it fits right in with the lesson, providentially enough. So if you will, turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. We're going to be reading a little bit here. I had no idea last year when I volunteered to teach a class on Nehemiah. I don't think I knew what I was getting into other than I just thought I'll, I'll try and teach a class on Nehemiah. And the Lord helped me to learn so much about uh, Nehemiah and the, the individual that he was, the things that he did. And then you kind of sit back and you think about it, and you know, you say, well, gee whiz, I can do some of those things too if I try like Nehemiah did. But let's look and see what Nehemiah, how we started off. Nehemiah chapter 1. It says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Halakiah. It came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, that as I was in Sushan, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah. And I asked concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity. And, and they said to me, the survivors who are left in captivity in the province are in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. To help you understand why that's a great reproach or a risk, back then in those days, cities were protected by city walls that went all the way around the perimeter. And this kept the bad guys out or at least slowed them down long enough that they could mount up defenses and attend to that portion of the wall, hopefully keeping the enemy out. Although the problem here is right now, Jerusalem, after everybody's been carried away in captivity and some of them have come back, the walls are non-existent. In other words, there's no physical protection for Jerusalem at this time. And so it was, verse 4, when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I said, I pray, Lord, God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who you love and observe your commandments, Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. After reading this prayer, I learned something different about how to pray. Because that I understand, Nehemiah is starting off here by praising God. Uh, a lot of times I'm guilty of saying, dear Lord, please help me with this, please do that. And I, it's like a nagging little child coming up to, I view myself, coming up to a parent saying, I need this, and I, without saying, hey, mom, dad, I really appreciate everything you're doing for me. And that's what I have, for myself, noticed about the way that Nehemiah starts off here. He praises God for all the things that he, and rightly so, we should do. Because he does so many things for us that a lot of times we just take it for granted. I mean, we could be halfway around the world over in uh, <laughs> Ukraine. I forgot the name for a moment. We could be over in Ukraine trying to figure out if we were going to have a home in the evening. And folks over there have got a pretty, and look at Maui. There's folks over there. They don't have a home to go home to tonight. All of us do. So we're so abundantly blessed. Let's keep reading. Uh, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your, your servants, and confess the sins of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, the ordinances of that which your commander, your servant, Moses, which 
Let me say again. Which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. Let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cup bearer. And the thing that I like about, uh, it stands out to me about what Nehemiah is saying here, this man is doing three things I'd like to focus on tonight. Number one, he's starting off with a prayer. Number two, he's formulating a plan. And if you read the 13 chapters of the book of Nehemiah, you will see that he sticks to and finishes that plan that he starts. And when we're working for the Lord, serving the Lord as servants, whatever it is we plan to do, we need to stay with it, even at times when it seems like other people are working against us, as happened here with individuals named Sam Ballot and Tobiah. They were totally against the restoration of the wall. But Nehemiah oftentimes ignored them, and he kept on going because he had prayed. He had come up with a plan, as you see in chapter 2, when he goes and talks to the king. And you look at the, this individual and you say, you know what, this is a good example that I can follow. I would like for us now to turn over into Matthew. And we're going to go to chapter 15. And let's start at about verse 21. And I specifically chose this one because I, when in giving a lesson, I always like to focus on what, what men and women can do because each have unique abilities. Men can do things that women can't do. Obviously, when, women can do things that men can't do. And I'd like to look at what this woman here does. She's referred to in Matthew as a Gentile woman. I believe it is, or I think it's a woman of Canaan, and she's referred to in the book of Mark as a Syrophoenician woman. So we'll begin reading here in verse 21 and chapter 15 of Matthew. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. And he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. Imagine that. Jesus is there with his disciples, and he's there to minister to people. And here comes this woman, obviously in need of help, and she's imploring, she's begging Jesus to help her out. And the disciples are like, Hey, you know, let's get her out of here. She's bothering us. And I'm like that sometimes. I don't see what's right in front of my face that the Lord is trying to get me to see because I'm not thinking the way that Jesus thinks. I'm thinking the way that Andrew thinks, and that's not always a good thing. But we can learn things from looking at this lesson here. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he's telling her, I can't help you out because I'm only sent to the lost sheep. In other words, the Jews. And she's not a Jew. She's from Canaan. But look what she does. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. She knows who she's talking to. She's saying, Lord, help me. And again, he tells her, what I'm here for is not for you. It's for the children of Israel. But look what she does. And she said, yes, Lord. She agrees. 
Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And you look at the perseverance of this woman. She has prayed right there to the Lord, help me out. She has a plan in her mind. She's got a daughter back home that's demon-possessed. It's obvious she is not leaving. She's going to keep being committed to what is the goal before her. And folks, I think that's a good example for the rest of us because sometimes we can get sidetracked when things get difficult. And we can think, you know what, uh, I'll come back tomorrow, maybe it'll be a better day. That's not what she does. She stands right where she's at. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. And that's, I think, so important for us. She prayed, number one. She had a plan, number two. Number three, she didn't give up. She stayed focused on serving God, and she got, as we see so many times throughout the Bible, examples of, of uh, servants in the Bible, men and women, Esther, Ruth, we could go on that they did not give up, they stayed focused, they did the right thing, oftentimes very humbly compared to the way things are done in the world today. But you see how God answers those prayers. Let's take a look at somebody named Elisha, one of the prophets in the Old Testament. Second Kings, chapter 6, starting in verse 8. Second Kings, Chapter 6, uh, starting about verse 8. Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel, and he consulted with his servants, saying, My uh, camp will be at such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, in other words, Elisha, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down. And when the king of Israel sent someone to the place in which the man of God had told him, thus he warned him. And he was watchful there, not just once or twice. In other words, Elisha knew what the Syrian king was planning to do. And he advised the king of Israel, be careful, there's going to be some trouble there. And he listened to his advice. Verse 11, therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and he said to them, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? The king of Syria is upset because he, feel like, he figures he's got a rat in there somewhere who's giving out his plans to the king of Israel. He doesn't know who it is, but what he's trying to do, the king of Israel is finding out about it. Verse 12, And one of the servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Imagine getting that kind of response back, that the prophet in Israel knows what you're saying in your own bedroom. So the king of Syria responds in verse 13. So he said, go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And it was told him saying, surely he is in Dothan. So they figure out where Elisha is. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God, in other words, the servant of Elisha, arose early the next morning, went out. There was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Think about this. The servant gets up. He goes outside maybe to get some water ready to wash themselves, start the day with. And he's looking around, and they are surrounded by the Syrian army. And he's like, all he can do is go back inside and say, my master, we're surrounded. What are we going to do? Listen to how Elisha responds. So, verse 16, he answered, do not fear for those who are with us. Remember this. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. That was so true then as it is now. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he, as well as we, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountains 
mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Imagine the servant's eyes when he could actually spiritually see what was out there all around them, chariots of fire. And he knew that nothing bad was going to happen to them because God was taking care of them. And behold, excuse me, uh, verse 18, so the chariots, uh, so when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. God hears and answers our prayers. Verse 19, now Elisha said to him, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you see. But he led them back, well, he led them, it says, to Samaria. So in other words, he was leading them into a trap. And they followed him. Verse 20, so it was when they had come to Samaria, <coughs> excuse me, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes <clears throat> Pardon me. The Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and they, there they were inside Samaria. In other words, the soldiers of Syria had followed Elisha because they couldn't see. They had been struck blind. They now realize, once their eyes have been opened, we're in a trap. We're in Samaria. They can do with us whatever they want to do. Verse 21, now when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, my father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? The king of Israel realizes, excuse, or Israel is often referred to as Samaria, realizes, you know what? We can take care of the problem right now. We'll just kill them right here on the spot. But look what Elisha does, and it's the same thing that Christ did. But Elisha answered, you shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and your bow? Set food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Then he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had ate and drank, he sent them away and they went to their master, the king of Syria. So the bands of Syrian raiders came to no more into the land of Israel. Isn't that what Jesus would do when confronted with enemies? He had the power to destroy them instantaneously, and yet he didn't, even to the last moment on the cross. Because why? You never know what good you can accomplish by showing grace, love, and mercy to other people. And as we read here at the end of these verses, it says, the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. And so by what Elisha the prophet told the king of Israel to do, in other words, you treat these people, these prisoners of war, fairly. Feed them, give them water, let them go back home. And what happens? They go back home, and the Bible tells us they don't come back anymore at that point in time to attack Samaria. And you look at Nehemiah, the, the Canaanite woman, Elisha, there's three things that stand out. Prayer, they had a plan, and they followed through on that plan. Obviously, Elisha had a plan from, I want to say, the Lord. And he, even in a way, gives us an example for us today, looking at the life of Christ, how we should treat other people. I told you I had something interesting happen after church today, and it wasn't really a part of the lesson, but now it is. Um, years ago, uh, Trey and some other young men from this church went out to help a family. And uh, they were out there. They were helping them, I think, install some plumbing and things like that. And as I recall, uh, Trey was telling me uh, they were out there working on Sunday afternoon, and they got kind of late working and everything. And finally, uh, they just said, you know what? Uh, it's too late to go back to the building. We'll just have church here tonight. So they had a, a little worship service out there. And Trey was asking one of the young girls out there, do you know why we're here? And she said, yeah. And Trey was like, well, why is that? And she said, well, we prayed for you. 
And he said, that was the last answer I was expecting, you know. Uh, they were going to have some other kind of an answer. I'm like, well, that makes all the sense in the world. They prayed that God would send somebody. Well, here we are. And so that family started coming to church. Uh, most of the family was baptized. Uh, with COVID, different people have quit coming to church and so on. And uh, today I was walking out of the assembly here, going to go down the hallway, and I thought I saw somebody else over there I was going to go say hi to. And I, as I got closer, I realized it was one of the young girls that had previously come from that family. And she had brought her kids with her today. And so we were talking and everything, and she said, Oh, yeah, I got a card from Monticelli. Card ministry. Pray, have a plan, take action. And she's like, uh, is there anything I can do around here to help volunteer? Do you have any classes for my kids? Yeah. And so, as we read about in the Bible, or we see today, it's the little things that some people might say little. I think they're rather spiritually grand. Uh, that we do, we have no idea, as did Nehemiah, the Canaanite woman, Elisha, how many people we're going to impact. But they, as did Adeseli and the other ladies in the card ministry, leveraged themselves, made themselves available for the hopeful well-being of other people seeking to gain nothing back for themselves. And I think it's an encouragement to us to know, personally, I think it's providential, God knowing the lesson I was going to give tonight, that that young lady was in the hallway. And it just struck me as it fit right in because it's an example of women of this congregation purposing on their heart to get together and send out cards to people who used to come. And for whatever reason, they're, they're not presently coming. But that doesn't mean they won't come again if we reach out to them. And I was at one brother's house one evening. Uh, he doesn't read English, but he said, Hermano, I got all these cards. Tell, tell me what they say. And I'm like, I read the cards to him, you know. And he was just like a little kid that was turned loose in a toy store. He didn't know what, to, he was beside himself. And those little things, those little small things you do, they make a tremendous impact on the lives of other people. And so with that, I would encourage each one of us tonight, look for ways that you can leverage yourself with the talents that you've got to help other people because you really have no idea the impact it's going to have on those individuals. And so we, we, we learn from these stories in the Bible what we can do and can still do today to make an, an impact on other people for the kingdom. We, where we hope that all of us were going to be someday. And so in closing, I would ask if there's anyone here who has any needs of the congregation, either through prayer or you've made a decision to become a, a child of Christ, for us to come forward. I think uh, Matt's going to lead us in uh, a song that he's already got picked out. Uh, I think it's number 674. Is that right, Matt? I hope that's right. I ask you to please.